Okay, everyone, welcome to Living Word Worship Center. I'm three minutes late already, <laughs> but uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Wednesday night Bible class here, and uh, thank you on Facebook who are viewing remotely. God bless you. Thank you for being part of this. And uh, you you probably will notice if you've been watching that the background's a little bit different. We're in a different room this week. They're having a rummage sale in our classroom for the next, at least the next Wednesday, this, the next Wednesday and probably after that. <clears throat> and, but in the meantime, we're here in the sanctuary and we're kind of improvising, but uh, all else is uh, the same and we're glad to be here, and glad you're here. So we want to open up uh, our service uh, with prayers as we usually do. We ask that those of you at home here uh, would um, pray along with us and we'll be praying with you in the sanctuary, of course. We do this, as you know, every Sunday morning during the live service and also on uh, every Wednesday evening we have prayers. So if you're in the church, of course, you can request, it in, request your prayers in person. If not, you can go to my Facebook page, as you probably know by now, and at the top of my page always is the post there where you can put your request there, and we bring them to the next live service after you request it. And then once we do pray, like tonight, in, in a couple of minutes, we're going to have prayer. After that prayer, then we will reset the list and it starts again tomorrow with a new list. So if you'd like prayers again or to continue after tonight, then you have to be sure and come back and add it again. And we appreciate that very much. And um, so just to name a few here, uh, just call off their names. Riley Yergen, it's a little baby waiting for the uh, donor heart for Keith and Kelly and Julia Johnson family, for Marie Minor, that's my aunt again, uh, for Amy D, for Laura P, David D, Ethan D, Alan Sandy Palumbo, Eugene Johnston, Karen Johnston, Judy Hickerson, and Kate uh, Carapina, it looks like, if I got that, I hope I got that close. And uh, for Greta Owens, more of my family, Jim Hatfield, uh, friend, Beverly P, Don M, I think that's Rita Schreier's family, and uh, John Manier and Dave, also Wes Bowling, who we've been praying for. His father passed away uh, s since we prayed last on Sunday. So remember that family. Also for Helen, for Earl, for Ellen, Greg, and Maria Stone, looks like, where well, I shouldn't have said that, I guess, but it's okay. And for Heather also. For John, I guess, uh, there's, the note says is there was a four-wheeler accident, and, and there's going to be surgery subsequent to that. For Karen, for Rose Lynn, for Keegan, Caddy, Olivia, for Doug Smith, for Tina Detler, her household, she, uh, she said everybody's got COVID in the whole house, so there you go. Tina, God bless you. You're going to be okay, all of you. Just you won't, won't be long. You'll be good. For Mark Y., for the Dietz family, for Rena Smith, uh, for Michi, for Shane, Ruth Ann, for Reba, for Lloyd, for Anne, for Valerie, and for Raymond. And so, would there be a late one here, or should we, or are we good in the room here? We're good? Okay, so we'll ask you at home, and those of you in the room, let's pray together uh, for these folks we, who we've mentioned. Our Father, we thank you this evening, and we do thank you, we really mean that. We appreciate this opportunity and the desire that you have created in our hearts to come together for this common purpose of just learning of the Lord and, and being near and in your presence and experiencing all that you would have for us in, in the moment that we have set aside for this purpose and for 
on behalf of every person whose name has been called out, we ask that you would minister to them in the way that only you can. And we also ask you to, to for your blessing and, and bestow the, your, your blessing upon all those who are also praying with us. For I know that many are praying and not all are asking for prayer. Many more are praying with us. And so we ask your blessing upon them on the remainder of this service here this evening and that you would open our eyes, our hearts, our ears, that we may receive from you that which is really meat to our, to our very soul. And we need it. We need the nourishment. We need the strength. We need every word that proceeds from your mouth here this evening. And may your blessing continue to, to expand and really multiply in our lives and continue to give us the strength to carry on in all that you've called us to do and the grace it, that you supply is sufficient. We thank you for this and all good things. In Jesus, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Okay, let me move over here for a second. Okay. Ah, very good. So we want to pick up with the, uh, the second week of the teaching we began last week called Understanding Redemption. And our beginning verse is Ephesians 1 and 7. Says in him, this is Paul, the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses or of our sins, according to the riches of his grace powerful text so just to quickly review and bring us up to speed with where we left where we left off last week the word redemption itself is quite quite um, a broad and also deep word and you can study this word almost indefinitely for as long as you care and everything about it points to one thing as great as this redemption is the deeper and the farther you go with it the more clearly it is defined as the pure grace of God none of this is obtainable in any other way except by God's gift so this is really the bottom line and the essence of everything from God. The Bible says every good and perfect gift is from above, the Father of lights. But the word itself is an amazing word. And I just I have abbreviated this definition because it was like two pages long last week. But it essentially for tonight it means the process of being saved from sin, from error, which is really important, and from evil. Redemption means to buy back, to redeem, by paying the ransom or the outstanding debt or lien. The lien, I think you probably, when you think of a lien against something, you would think most likely of a lien against a car or a house or something that you still owe a debt on. And so long as that debt is attached uh, until that debt is paid, you are not the full and complete owner in the sense of being able to do anything with it uh, that you wish to do. You can't do anything with your house or your car or anything else if you owe money on it because you're only um, partially owner, I'll say. So there was a lien on us. There was a claim against us. There was a debt that was owed. We had committed crimes we had committed sins in which there were if you think in the legal terms there were fines attached there were penalties attached and until these are paid we are not free to live as we choose so this is the idea of buying back or ransom of course the word that you think of most or i do 
is in the case of a person being uh, kidnapped or taken hostage and held for a ransom and would be continued to be this prisoner um, of the one who takes them until the ransom is paid. This was us. This is all people before Christ or without Christ. We were in debt. We were not our own. We're owned by another because of our own willful uh, venturing into this indebtedness. And until someone buys us back, we will remain the property of, the, of our taskmaster, so to speak. So think of ransom or paying the lien. Also, it means to fulfill a promise. In this sense, um, the promise that is most uh, fitting is the promise in Genesis at the very beginning when man fell, when man fell and was estranged or cut off from God, if you will, God issued the promise then that a redeemer would come one day. One would come with redemption. This one is often referred to as the Messiah or the Savior. And that one day he would come and he would pay the penalty, he would pay the debt, and we would be liberated uh, from this terrible condition that we got ourselves into. It also means, and that, of course that promise was fulfilled in Christ when he brought redemption. So there's the fulfilling or the keeping or making good of a promise. It was redeemed in Christ. Also, uh, it means, it has a certain meaning, uh, to, be, to restore something or someone in this case to a former state in the beginning man was very good man lived in a perfect environment he himself had no flaws or anything uh, that was not perfect he was created in the image and likeness of God by God himself in a perfect way he lived in a perfect world. He couldn't blame anything on his environment. He didn't, there was no wrong side of the tracks. It was just perfect, very good. So in that state, he would have lived forever, of course, because the wages of sin is death, and without sin there would be no death, and without death, then of course life is what you have. So we know that he broke that covenant, that violation, that agreement, that uh, sanction that God had given him. And when he did so, then God made a promise that, that one would come later, not to redeem man, but to provide the opportunity for man. Should he choose to be redeemed, he would be able to. Men, since the fall, and this is important. Men have always wanted to be saved, but there was no way that they could be saved, no matter what they did, no matter how hard they tried, no matter how many hundreds and even thousands of years that they practiced all of these various um, different dispensations and covenants of God. None of, the, none of these were able to fully redeem man until the Redeemer himself came to fulfill the promise. And in that, in that case, then man would be restored to his former state and more. And this former state is also, um, it's worth adding, in a, he is also in an opposite state. He is the exact opposite of what he was. He once was saved, then he was lost. Now we can say, we once were lost, but now we are saved. The difference, and this is worth noting, this will help kind of your frame of reference in your mind, I think, in this whole scene and scenario that I'm describing. What Adam had, we now have and more. 
You say, well, how can we have more? He was in paradise. He was in the Garden of Eden. There was no sin, no suffering, no death, none of that. But there had not yet been man's choice to live or to walk with God. In the beginning, God chose man. He created man. It was entirely God's choice. Entirely his actions. Everything was made that was made by God himself. So man was the recipient of God's choice to make the man. So God chose the man. But now, beyond that, man had not yet passed the test. Man had not yet chosen God. So when the choice came, the cho a choice by definition means there are at least two options, or it's not a choice. In the beginning, there was no choice until the temptation came. When the temptation came through the serpent in the garden and all that, to, to quickly run through that, now man for the first time is confronted with the choice God has chosen man but man has not yet chosen God so man's choice Adam's choice was to reject God and embrace the other God so in that we call in that we have the fall Man's choice. God chose man, but man did not choose God. And he fell as God declared he would. But the promise of, re of redemption, that the Redeemer would come, and that Redeemer would, would restore man's choice again. Now, men have a choice again that they did not have until Christ came and provided redemption should man choose for himself so now unlike in the beginning when god chose man man now has the privilege of choosing god and until man chooses god eternity is not settled so do you see that i hope i hope you didn't used to understand it and now you don't suddenly but do you see do you see how God chose man? Yes. But man was not yet tested. He had not yet made his choice for God. He had the choice. He was made in the image and likeness of God with the free will to choose who he would serve. So now we live in the day that's beyond that. Now we live in the day that man does have a choice. And if he chooses God, he will live forever as a result. That's right. And until man chooses God in return for God choosing him, eternity is not yet settled. So I think that's worth noting. Okay. So, sorry? It has to be. It's a two-way. We are, God, there's no man that God doesn't choose for salvation. That has never happened, ever. But as we know, sadly, not all men do choose God in return. All who reject him will be severed from him, you know, for eternity. Okay. There's a, uh, also a legal aspect that I want to touch on just a little bit before we leave this subject or this area. There's a redemption with a legal aspect to it. And I'm, not, I'm not making a direct uh, definition uh, to this, but what I am saying is there is a context, a legal context for redeeming something that's rightfully yours or was once yours and was illicitly or, Ill, or illegally or somehow forcefully taken from you and you go to court, let's say, 
to sue this person who stole something from you and there's a judgment on your behalf in the court that you are to be awarded your rightful property back. You have proved that you're the rightful owner. It belongs to you. Uh, all has been resolved. All has been settled clearly. And you now have a judgment in your favor to reclaim or redeem what's rightfully yours. Christ is every man's defense attorney who chooses to hire him. He is the one man I mentioned this Sunday, I'm pretty sure in the sermon. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. This mediator is the one who, who is there on your behalf before God the judge. He's presenting your case. Now, there's no doubt that every single man was guilty. We've all sinned and come short. No man can go into this court and claim he's falsely accused he never sinned. If he does, now he's guilty of lying publicly. So we know we're all guilty, but with the right attorney, with the right defender, the defender can show that our crime has been covered, that our debt has been paid. If we stole money, it has been repaid. If we dishonored something, it has been honored in our stead. The crime that we committed has been paid back. We've done, or our attorney has presented a case before the judge saying that he, uh, he did do this, but now I have paid the penalty for him and the debt is settled and the judge declares him now no longer a prisoner, you're free to go, like that. The simplest way to describe it is if, you're, if your child steals a candy bar from the corner store mm -hmm. and you go down to the store and you pay for the candy bar right. so they don't have to take your kid to jail. So you're a good dad. Okay. But essentially to regain or recover property by judgment and the, the property was us, Christ reclaimed us by bailing us out once and for all. Okay. Okay. Psalms 49, 7, a good verse. No man can possibly redeem his brother or pay his own ransom to God, his or his own. For the redemption of his soul is costly and no payment is ever enough that he should live on forever and not see decay. No man can ever ransom another man's soul. Number one, every other man is guilty also. A guilty man cannot redeem a guilty man, only the righteous can, Christ, of course, being the only righteous one. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we'll just read quickly through that. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now, now, all things are of God. The new things are of God. The new is of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. The old passed away, the new is come. And the new that is come is from God and has given us this same ministry. What God has done for us, what Christ has done for us in reconciling us back to God, he has given us this same ministry that we would also now go and reconcile others to God in the same way that we have been reconciled. So we have a ministry. We're all ministers. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, but imputing them to Christ, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. 
This is what I'm telling you tonight. Through Christ, be reconciled to God, period. Not through religion, not through anything else, just Christ. There's one thing standing between you and God, that is the man Christ Jesus. Through him is the way to God, and no other way. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So I like to paraphrase it this way. Christ took the blame for our sin. And gave us the credit for his sinlessness. He took the blame for us. It's like you taking the blame for you, for your younger, uh, younger brother, whatever you know they do something, and you say, "You, you take the the heat." Yeah, heat will be polite. You take the heat for them. You didn't do it, but you're taking the punishment for them. The wages of sin is death, and every single person is worthy of that. Christ himself released us from the death chamber, from death row. He himself came and sat down in the chair that we were slated to sit in for execution. And he was electrocuted for us. And since the law of double jeopardy does not allow two payments for one crime, the crime is now settled. So while he dies, we go free and live. Okay, I'll pick a little bit up on that later. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There's an exchange. Salvation is an exchange. Christ for us. The innocent for the guilty. He died, we live. You have to think in those terms. Every man is a hopeless debtor to his own inward nature. He has that downward gravitational pull in him to do wrong. Every child, every baby ever born, as soon as he's old enough to do it, is going to commit everything wrong he could possibly do. He's going to take all the other kids' stuff. He's going to be selfish. He's going to throw tantrums. He's going to disobey everything you tell Who teaches children to do this? It's in their blood. It's, 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 it. He is a hopeless debtor to this. He's not doing this intentionally or, or uh, what is it, premeditated. He's just being normal for him. Okay? This is the gravitational pull, downward pull in every man until Christ lives in that man. Okay. He tells himself he's going to change soon, but he never does. He desperately hopes for a miracle before the bill is due. He's hoping somehow miraculously uh, or some magic thing. He thinks he, he can keep living this way and the results will change even though he hasn't changed. It's folly. It's fatal in the end. John 1 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He takes it away. He doesn't brush it under the rug. It's gone. Christ paid the sin debt 2,000 years ago with his own blood. And I said this last week. Imagine someone, anyone, worrying their whole life about a bill that is coming due and then learning at the end of their life that someone else had already paid that bill for them. 
and they had worried and, and lived in fear their entire life and had lost a lifetime of joy and freedom just for not knowing that the debt was paid. That's the debt we owe the world to tell them just exactly that, that Christ is not counting your offenses against you, but he has counted them all against Christ. Receive Christ immediately. The second chance won't help. Men will always do the same thing again. The man who has not changed will not wise up and do better the next time. He will only fail again because he is the same old man because failure is in the blood of every man. He, will, he means to do it. He says he'll do it. He tells himself he'll do it. He tells others he'll do it. But when the time comes, he simply cannot do it. It's in his blood. Until the blood of Christ comes into his life, he cannot do differently. The scripture says, I can't remember it word for word, but it's more or less like this. Can you who have done evil all your life now do good? You cannot. We have to be born again, period. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are led not by what we see or feel. We are led by what we believe, by faith. Reality is that all people live by faith, by what, by what they believe to be true. It's impossible to live any other way. No one can. The only question, of course, is what do they believe? Whatever you do believe is, will determine how you live. If you, if you believe that you, don't, that you could just stay home and do nothing and money would just fall out of the sky magically to you, well, then you will live that way. And uh, I think some people might believe that. <laughs> but they're going to get pretty hungry waiting. Everyone lives by faith. Faith is... Faith... There's nothing more powerful than faith. It is what we are on the inside. It's who we are. It's what we really believe. No matter what we say. It's what we really, really believe on the inside. If we believe we can get by with this, we'll do it. If we do not believe it, we'll be hesitant to do it. The Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there's no God. So he tells himself, there's no God. All you have to do is watch him and see how he behaves. And you'll know he's, told, he's telling himself, there's no, he don't believe there is a God. Watch a politician. See how they vote. You'll know, no matter what they say, they all claim this and claim that, and then when the time comes, they'll, they'll come up with some scripture somebody handed them, act like they're big theologians or believe in the Bible and all this. Watch how they vote. Watch how they vote. How they vote will tell you what they really believe. There's a lot of politicians, I mean this, not just politicians, people but especially politicians who would not vote the way they vote if they really believed there was a God, even though they say they believe. They are liars. What you believe in your heart is there is a God or there isn't, and that will set the course for your life. Not because you're afraid, but because you are not afraid to do the right thing. Hallelujah. You're not afraid of losing anything you gain everything in Christ. Okay. If they believe fully in Jesus Christ for their salvation, they will be saved. If they believe in anyone else except Jesus or anyone else in addition to Jesus. This is more important. There are plenty of people in these off-brand religions that are not Christianity. And when, when they want to debate with you or argue with you, number one, you shouldn't be doing that. But, if you, but if you probably remember if you've ever done this, they're quick to say, well, I believe in Jesus and also Mormonism and also Jehovah's Witness and also I believe in these others and I believe in Buddha. I heard a guy on the radio. Well, you, today, this afternoon, 
He's a Buddhist. He's been, for 20 years, he's been calling on the radio and telling people why Christianity and Buddhism is the same thing and this and that. For 20 years, this guy's... <laughs> what we believe predetermines the course of our life, what we really believe. Okay, so, but everyone lives by faith. The question is, in what? If, but you cannot add, Jesus is, the, the, the Old Testament says this, and this is the context for that. God says he is a jealous God. He will have no other gods before him. It's not that he, that he has an ego problem or a complex. God, this, God knows what happens to you when you get a bunch of gods together. You're going to be, you're going to be lost. Hallelujah. You only need the one true God because you don't need another one. Another one is not possible or necessary. This is the God who is the creator of everything. Hallelujah. So, okay. So the old life, we learned last week, and I love this. I love this picture. You should get this in your head to where you can kind of explain this to people. You have the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Okay, this is the gospel at all times, no matter how you phrase it. The death, burial, resurrection of Christ. The beautiful picture of that, symbolic picture in the New Testament church ordinance is the ordinance of water baptism. This is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Now, let's look at this. The purpose of the cross is not to save the old man or the sinner. The cross doesn't save. Nobody's ever been saved by being nailed to a cross. Everyone ever nailed to a cross was killed. That's the point. It is, it's the ancient electric chair, whatever you want to call it, capital punishment. It's the most horrific way to die. You could, one of the most horrific ways you could ever imagine a human being would die, especially if there's a lot of torture involved in, in the process. But the cross does not save. The cross is a prelude to salvation. Without the cross, there could be no salvation because the cross gets rid of the incurable, impossible, can never rehabilitate. There's nothing you can do with that old man. You cannot fix him. He is not repairable. I don't, if you educate him, you just have a bigger, smarter thief and liar now because he knows more ways to steal and lie. He's more educated now. But he is still a thief, a worse thief. There's nothing you can do to save the old man. He has to go. He cannot be redeemed. He has to be <laughs> removed from the picture. The old man passes away. We just read that. Okay? The purpose of the cross is not to save the old man, but to execute him, to put him to death. To put him to death means he now is incapable of inflicting any more trouble again. He's dead. He can then be replaced by the new man of the spirit. And this new man is from God. And this new man will never see death ever. He is the opposite of death. He is the remedy for death. So we we'll study this. On which side of the cross do we live? Before the cross or after the cross? So of course we're on the far side of the cross. We are past the cross. For many years, for thousands, of years, for four thousand years, four thousand years from Adam to Christ, for four thousand years, people lived on the front side of the cross, waiting for Messiah to come. And now we know, and all those who have studied the Old Testament and Scripture, we know that this that it was described in prophecy. 
time and time again in some pretty, um, pretty in-depth detail of the things to, that were to be expected when Messiah did come. Isaiah particularly, about he was so under, he was beaten so brutally. Not only did you not recognize who he was, you barely, you almost couldn't recognize that he was even a human being. He didn't even look like a man. He was so, he was just a beaten, bloody pulp, unrecognizable. It was worse than words. So this was all prophesied, that all this would happen. And that was for 4,000 years, they waited for Messiah to come. And everyone before that eventually died. Since Adam introduced death, Adam died and everyone after them because Adam is the father of the human race and death was in him, it was in his blood and he passed it on to his children. They all had this fatal incurable disease, if you will, and it's called death. It kills every single child you have. So this was certain. For 4,000 years, they waited in faith, believing that one day Messiah would come. And they, they, they didn't just sit around reading the newspaper. They were slaves in Egypt and the most persecuted people to this day ever on the planet. Waited in faith in spite of everything. They never abandoned the faith entirely. And that faith finally produced Christ, through all the patriarchs, through Isaiah, through Moses, through Abraham, through all of them, until finally, in the fullness of time, Christ came. So, and then he went to the cross and put to death all that was, all that was death in us. He came and he took the death that he found in us. And he took it upon himself. He who had never known death took it, took the death he found in us upon him. The sin and the death are the same. Death is not the subsequent payment that follows sin. It is built in. You cannot have sin without death. It's two sides of the same coin. You can't have a one-sided coin. Don't think about that too long. It's like the sound of one hand clapping. <laughs> the, brain, the brain doesn't compute some things. But you get the point. The people, we, we are sort of new at this. For 4,000 years, they were behind the cross. We've only been in front of it 2,000 years. But the beauty of the eternal work of the Spirit, I need to say this now. There is no time nor distance in the Spirit, in spiritual things, in eternity, in the work of the Holy Spirit. He has no age. He's God. You can't, he's not like a tree you can cut him down and count the rings and see how old he is. He always is, was, is, am. So the work of the Spirit is not um, restricted to any present time or time at all. So what that means is this is said specifically of Abraham. This is redemption. Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, Abraham believed that God would bring the Savior in the future. And the moment Abraham believed that he would be saved later, 
his faith, that belief was credited to him as righteousness. So Abraham was saved in a very real sense in that way before salvation was available historically in the year zero. Believing that God would is receiving it then. So Abraham was saved in advance of the cross, before the cross. Many, many years, many generations before the cross. Because he believed God. He believed God and he got credit for being a righteous man. Now what is that? Think of credit. Think of credit. You go to the, you know, you go to the store, you buy, you buy a nice suit of clothes. I buy it on credit. I get the clothes now. I get the suit now. It'll be paid for later. But I have it now in advance. It was credited to me. So I just wear it like it's mine. It's the same as mine. When the bill came, 4,000 years from Genesis, it was paid. So Abraham looked forward to the cross and was saved by believing in advance. He got salvation on credit. Does that make sense? This is the salvation is the work of the Spirit, new birth of the Spirit. This is eternal Holy Spirit. This is spiritual work. This is the spiritual works of God. So Abraham got saved on credit long before the bill came. He had salvation, righteousness. We look back behind us 2,000 years ago. And when we look back there and believe now, we are saved after the fact. The historical fact is historical only in the annals of history. When God promises it, it is history in advance. When God promises it, it's done when he promises it. It's done. It's a done deal when he says it. So we look back 2,000 years on the cross. Somebody, you know, you, people will say, well, what's a guy, you know, dying on a cross 2,000 years ago? How does that affect me? I wasn't even around. That was, you know, that was a long time ago. Not in the spirit. There is no time. There is no long. There is no ago. You look back and live. Abraham looked ahead and lived. I like to illustrate this too. The Bible says Abraham saw the city of God afar off. The city of God. We, we can read about it now. Abraham saw the city of God afar off. But yet he died without ever entering that city. That city had not yet come. But Abraham, as a matter of historical fact, died in the earth then. But when Abraham saw the city of God far off, Abraham did not enter that city. But when he saw it, that city entered Abraham. When you see Christ afar off, Christ enters you. You enter Christ when you see Him. 2,000 years ago, 2 million years ago, 2 million years from now is not even in the conversation. This is the eternal work of the Spirit. It reaches back. It reaches ahead. It reaches to the sides. 
It reaches in all directions for all that we need. This is God. God is omnipresent. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that he's in time and space. It means he is, he is, it means time and space is in him, inside of him. He's not in time. Time came from in him. Hallelujah. God extends in all directions. The Spirit extends back, forward. So whatever you need, don't be shy. Ask. He can get it. Maybe it's over there. Maybe it's over here. Maybe it's back there. Maybe it's out in front of you. Ask and you'll receive it. Okay. So we live in the covenant, if you will, the new covenant as opposed to the old covenant. And what that simply means is each, in the beginning, God is a covenant God. He does nothing outside of covenant. Period. The covenant with Adam is easy to see. Every tree in the garden is good. Everything's good. Nothing can hurt you. You live forever. Everything's wonderful. Very good. However, don't break the covenant. Covenant, the root word of covenant is cover. I've given you cover. I've given you a place of cover. I've given you a place where nothing can get past the cover that I've given you. So don't, you know, it's like an umbrella. So, you know, it, the rain can't make, it can't get to you. Just don't stick your head out in, out from under the umbrella. You're going to get wet. So, of course, he did. So what happened was he violated the covenant. That covenant is now broken. Broken in the sense that in violating that covenant, Adam is no longer under cover. What's the first thing it says about him? Now he's running and hiding. He's naked and he's uncovered. And he's trying to cover himself up. What? What did he lose? He lost his cover. Now he's out exposed, wide open, where the devil and everything else can just get directly to him. Do you see? But then the next covenant, of conscience came up. And then when his conscience didn't save him, then the covenant that followed that. And each covenant, it's like you put man in a circle and you tell the man, you stay in this circle, you will live forever, nothing can get inside your circle and harm you. Just do what you're told, everything is wonderful. So naturally, he steps outside the circle. So now he's in trouble. So God creates or draws a bigger circle for him. He makes another covenant that takes into account the broken covenant that he just violated. So the covenant has to increase each time because man's sins and trespasses increase each time as he goes. The longer he goes, the worse he gets. The worse he gets, the greater God's grace is. So, the, so God just keeps giving bigger circles and bigger circles until finally there's no limit now. The sky is open. We have Christ in the heavens on our behalf. But do you see each time that God adds more grace? Wherever sin abounds, grace is much more abound. Do you see the ever-expanding grace of God? The more that man would go beyond his cover, the greater cover God would bring to save him again, each step of the way. So finally, of course, the culmination of that was in the cross and so forth. This new covenant that we live in now is forever. As long as men call on the name of the Lord, they'll be saved. You don't, there is no bigger covenant than Christ. That's it. Redemption has fully come. You don't need one. One is not possible. Okay, enough of that. 
As irreligious as it sounds, we do not live at the foot of the cross. Respectfully, the suffering Jesus still on the cross, still dying for us, still paying for our sins, is an affront to the gospel of the New Test of New Testament Christianity. Now, I'm not being disrespectful, I think I've set that up as best I know how to tell you the importance and the beauty of the cross is that it's it is the it is the necessary extermination the the necessary execution the necessary eliminating of the old from the equation from the scene from the picture in order that the new can come you cannot have both the you know the, the scripture says you can't serve god and the devil no man can't serve two masters no matter what you think so what I'm saying is we live on the other side of the cross not at the foot of the cross we're way past the cross we're past the grave we're past the resurrection we're past Pentecost we're past all of that so the old life ended at the cross new life begins at the resurrection for this study anyway Romans 6, 4, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. You know he lived a new life. We know that. He's alive now. God. I don't know. This keeps coming to me. I, I don't know if you guys saw this or not. It's so ridiculous. I hate to even bring it up. It's already up, right? I <laughs> already brought it up. There's this guy on TV, bless his heart. I think a fence post would have a higher IQ than this guy, with all due respect. And I wish I could meet him personally, because I have a lot I could help him with. I could help him. But they showed him a bunch of times on TV. And he, he had this big political rant going. And here was it, he was saying, if Jesus was alive today, if Jesus was still alive, he'd be on our side. He, he, he wouldn't be like these. He would be for this, this particular movement, for this religious. So help me, I, I, can't, I can't think of anything I've ever seen. That, it, that is just more crazy than this. Never in my life have I seen anything worse than this. If Jesus was still alive, if Jesus was alive, he'd be on our side. If Jesus was alive, he'd straighten out all these people that are this and that and all that kind of stuff. And he was on the opposite side of every possible thing that you could imagine that the Bible teaches. He, couldn't be, he could not have been more wrong. But if Jesus was alive, he'd be on our side. If Jesus was alive. And, and you, know, you know the sad part about, here's the sad part. Brenda knows, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. I can't believe it now. I can't believe they let this get to the air. But the sad thing about it was, not a single person said, uh, hey buddy, let me help you with this. In case you didn't know this, Jesus is alive. He's been alive as the man for 2,000 years and counting, and he's never going to die either. And neither are you ever going to die. And this Jesus guy that's on your side, you better hope you're right because you're going to be meeting him. I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a wise guy. So help me, this is on television. If Jesus was alive, he kept saying, if Jesus was alive, and I'm thinking, these genius reporters, not a one of them will say, he is alive, don't you know? Yeah. They just go right on. That did, they didn't even pick up on that. They didn't even, they said, oh yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, if Jesus was still alive. You know, if he wasn't dead, he would... Uh, 
you know, he'd be in here. He'd be involved in this. He wouldn't, he wouldn't put up with all this bad politics. He'd be on our side. He'd be defending all these. If, if, he, if only Jesus was still alive. Well, this is true. You can search, you can search this up. I hope I meet this guy. So anyway, Jesus was raised from the dead, buddy, in case you didn't know. And he is still alive, and so will you be. You're, you are an eternal creature. Your body is going to be gone here pretty soon, but you're eternal. You're going to be alive as long as Jesus is alive, as long as God is alive. There's nobody ever going to die, ever. Your only decision is... Where are you going to be? But you're going to be somewhere. He's on another planet now. You're going to be really on another planet then. Until if you don't realize it. But he had no friend. He didn't have a friend close enough or smart enough to tell him. Pipe down, buddy. There's some people who believe he is alive. He had no friends. No preacher. Certainly no news reporter would, would dare correct him. Oh, God forbid. So we too have a new life. Without the resurrection, there's no Savior. There's no sure word of prophecy. No scripture means nothing. There's no salvation. There's no hope beyond the grave. If Jesus is not the Savior, if he's not alive, there's no resurrection, then everything is over. There's no bigger fool than those who believe in this life only. Everyone present at Christ's crucifixion knew that nothing on earth would ever be the same again. Now, so the old life ended at the cross. Dead, gone, passed away. Old things passed away. New life begins with a brand new Man, right? right? Raised from the dead. Okay. Now, what lies between the cross and the resurrection? The cross on Friday, the resurrection on Sunday. What's between that on Saturday? What do you do with a dead person? In the grave. In the grave, the tomb, whatever you want to call it. But he was alive in his own words and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. But in between the old and the new is the grave. Okay? So the grave contains, buried in the grave there where it belongs... The twofold link between the old life and the new life. And the first one is memory. The memory is what I call the mental hook. It's the thinking, the thoughts about your past that only you know about. Now you've been through the Christian experience or whatever, but you're thinking before the cross. It's a hook. You know what a hook is. A hook has bait on it. And that bait looks good. Looks like you'd want it. But inside the bait is the hook. And once on the hook, enough. Once you're hooked hard enough, then you just get reeled right back in. Back into that death that former it's right here you're thinking about the things you used to do the 
people you did it with. You're just thinking. You see no harm in thinking. But it's a hook. And the other part of that, the second link, is the appetite. A physical appetite, a psychological appetite, the hormonal appetite. This is the hook. This is the twofold link, the twofold hook. So now you start thinking about somebody back there. Start to get these physical feelings again. Your appetite is whetted. Here you go. The memory triggers the appetite. That's why it's so important, and the Bible says so much about disciplining your thoughts, your thinking, and your mouth. Paul said, to paraphrase, it is a shame to, or for, for himself. He was speaking for himself, of course, and implied for us. I, those things I'm ashamed of, and I don't speak of them. I don't brag about those things you know, you, when, when you see, a, especially a young Christian, because they, they're going to get their head bumped a few times, even though they know everything. <laughs> oh, boy. No, and they just like to brag about what big sinners they were, and this, and look, look, at, look, look at me now. Look what God has done. And, uh, you know, and I would ne I'll never do those things again, and this and that. And, uh, you know, but... You, you just kind of cringe because you know there's a fire coming. And I don't know any, <laughs> I don't, I, I've never heard anybody being talked out of it yet. But, but if you got the goods, you'll make it. But this place for dead stuff, think this thinking about those things and then next thing you know thinking about the drug you think about it long enough or you know it could be adultery it could be anything leave it dead leave it where it belongs leave it where Christ put it he took all that mess to the cross with him. And in the hell itself, how much farther could he take it from us? And we just keep going out and digging it back up. Don't dig up these old graves. Let it stay buried. Discipline your thinking. What's the matter with you? The Bible is so clear on this. Think on these things. Think on the, what, what things soever are lovely and pure and of a good report. You, people, they, they almost are surprised to hear, well, you can't control your thinking. Well, of course you can. If you're, not, if you're not in control of your thinking, your thinking is in control of you. What's the matter with you? You can only think one thought at a time. Choose to think on other stuff, and, there, and you can't think on this over here. You can't do it. You can think on two different things real quickly, one after another, but not possible Two at the same time. There is no such thing as multitasking. <laughs> People claim to do it. They're just doing a bunch of stuff, half doing it, and going on. But the memory triggers the appetite. You think about the drug, and you think about the high. And you get to thinking again. The next thing you know, you're feeling something. 
And then the next thing, you're wanting it. And then all reason and sanity just goes out the window. Now you're just hormonal driven or addiction driven or whatever. This is all that magnetic pull that Christ buried, took to the cross and crucified on our behalf. So leave it alone. Leave it alone. 2 Peter 2.22. You can't say it better than this. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. A dog returns to his own vomit. And a sow, having been washed, to her wallowing in the mud. So the dog goes back. I know this sounds gross. It is gross. This is, it's not half as gross as what I'm talking about. That's true. At least a dog is just a dog. We ought to know better. The dog goes back to the thing that made him sick to begin with and wants to eat it again. Gosh. Pretty graphic. Or the sow. <laughs> you wash the pig off. As soon as you turn that pig loose, straight to the mud hole they go. We are not be, we have thinking. We have these things buried in Christ. He became these things for us and put them away from us and nailed them to the cross. So leave it alone. Discipline your thinking. Don't allow your, your mind to just wander and do anything you want to in your head. That's pure craziness. Pretty soon, it, pretty soon it will extend into other areas, believe me. And if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. This is not Christ. This is the grave. We are not grave people. We are resurrection life people. We've already been to the resurrection and beyond. We've been to Pentecost. We've been born again. There's no place to come back past Pentecost past the resurrection, and jump in the grave again. What kind of sense does that make? It sounds, sounds crazy when you say it. So there you go. So the twofold link is what? Memory and appetite. And they work together. So how do you deal with the memories? Romans 12, 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, not conformed, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your spirit is renewed the moment you believe and are born again. You have a new spirit. It'll never be more saved or more born again ever than it is in that first moment. But your mind then begins a process of renewal. Everything that is, you know, the, the entire mind needs to be renewed daily, all the time, constantly by the, by the world that we live in at that time. You can't, you can't, you can't, if you know what you're doing, you can't be a monk sitting in a cave chanting and doing weird demonic things thinking you're reaching out to God. You have to receive from the Word of God. Con do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Conformed means to be influenced from external forces or pressure. Things you see, hear, feel, and all that. But be transformed, which is the opposite. Be changed from the inside out. I said it a minute ago. Whatever a person believes in his heart will come out in his speech and in his life okay so this is how you deal with this memory thing these memories of that you had no business still hanging on to quit running the tape shut it off to paraphrase let god change you from the inside out unlike the culture around you always dragging you down god brings out the best in you wow isn't that good Renew your mind. What do you do? Simple. You fill it up with good things, other things. 
It's going, it can only be full of one thing at a time. Fill it up. Read and reread the Bible. This is the best remedy for wrong thinking. And let me say this, and I mean this. Don't argue with me ever again when I say this. <laughs> Do you no good in front of me to say, well, I read, but I don't really understand, or I have a problem reading, or I don't like to read, or I fall asleep, or I, I don't read that well, or I have, I have learning disabilities. I said read and reread. And re it's not just that, oh, you figured out all this stuff. No, the reading of it itself, you have to have. You can't say, well, I'll let somebody else read it to me. You have to, you have to get in the water yourself. You're not there to interpret and explain and understand all this stuff. You say, well, I don't understand it. Go read it again. I assume everybody reads. I assume every Christian reads the Bible. What I'm telling you is reread it and keep rereading it and keep rereading it as long as you're on this earth. Keep reading it and thanking God that you can and that you have a Bible that you can see and that you can read. Don't say, I don't understand it. I'll go listen to a video. You get your Bible and read. I don't care if you have zero education. Read. Read the Bible. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and always hearing, always hearing. Faith will keep coming. It never stops coming till you stop hearing. So that's my speech on that. Philippians 4.8. Finally, brethren, here's what you do about this mind thing. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is a deliberate, willful act, a choice of what to think on. Amen. Meditate. The word meditate is from the, I think the Latin word, or maybe Greek, meaning ruminate. Ruminate is what a cow does when it chews its cud. Do you know what, you ever, I don't know if, <laughs> I, I gotta be careful, I, I'm around people that's never seen a cow, I know, but maybe not in this room, but they just lay around and they chew it and chew it over again Chew it over again, chew it over again. That's how they digest it. They have, they, I forget how many stomachs they have and so forth. Four. Okay, thank you. Four stomachs. Wow. No wonder they have to chew. <laughs> but, but they are meditating. You see them laying there, you know, just laying on the ground, and you see their jaw going like this. They're meditating. They're, they are ruminating. But you choose what to think on. Well, then you're going to have to have some input from somewhere. Where are you getting it from? Television? You're going to renew your mind by television? God help you. That's the problem now in 90% of cases. But you do have a choice in what to think about. And when, when you catch yourself thinking about something, you choose to think about something else. I do this all the time when I'm trying to go to sleep. I don't have an easy time of it. I try to choose something that'll make me sleepy. <laughs> I, I just whatever 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 you think about that would take your mind away, so you can become unconscious. It'll be good things. It won't. If you get to thinking about all this crazy stuff I mentioned before, you'll be wide awake for sure. <laughs> you all too wild for me. So, okay, that's how you deal with your thinking. Get your nose in something and learn something and start thinking on other things. How to deal with the appetite? Here we go. First, repentance. Repentance means, it's not a religious word either, really, even though it has connotations. It means change your mind. That's what it means. Change your mind. Turn around. 180. 180. 
make an about face. Those of you, have you ever marched in marching bands or military bands, about face. That means the other way. I never forget this. this they was interviewing this new football coach on TV years ago. They said, he, he said, I know he didn't mean to say this. He said, we're turning this team around 360 degrees. Now the, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. That's like. That wasn't the guy who said if Jesus wasn't dead. <laughs> Second Corinthians seven ten, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation. Not to be regretted. You'll never regret this. But the sorrow of the world produces death. It has nothing else to offer, people. I'm telling you. Secondly, live by faith. What does live by faith mean? Does it mean act weird or religious? It means just follow the scripture. Do what the scripture says. Don't just look at it and say, I don't understand. I can't do that. And don't say this, whatever you say, I'm trying. Don't ever tell me you're trying because I know that's a lie. You're not trying anything. You're trying not to. You don't try to do this. You do it. Galatians 2.21, one of my favorite verses, the life I live in the body, which has appetites and memory, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hearing produces faith. Faith produces conversion or change. This is why you have to keep reading. Because while you're saying, I'm not understanding this or I'm bored with it, while you're doing that, you're being changed. You just don't, you just, just don't be dumb. Listen to me. You're being changed. You cannot, you cannot go near the living word of God in any way and not be changed in some way by it. You just can't do it. You, I don't care what you say. You open that Bible and you read that Bible. Hearing produces faith. Faith produces conversion. A definite change comes. And conversion produces, here's the key, new appetites, new desires, new urges. The Bible says, I don't think I have this text in here, but it, it says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desire of your heart. So when you delight yourself in the Lord, when you're thinking on this and you're reading his word, you can't become, you can't grow spiritually unless you are in a spiritually growing conducive environment like this room like home with your Bible when you delight yourself in the Lord your heart is delighting in the right things and therefore since God wants you to have the right things he will give them to you you will have the desire of your heart the delighted heart will always have its desires fulfilled. So, let's see if we can get another one in. Two minutes. An unhealthy appetite is a perversion of a healthy appetite. This is true in all cases. I don't care what it is. You know, medicine is a good thing, but people abuse it and they get hooked and it can kill you. Food is the same way. If you undereat, you die. If you overeat, you die. You're supposed to have a healthy appetite. Psalm, oh, here it is. Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the Spirit. We will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But what we always do, this... 
if we're the people who say, I don't understand the Bible, I got Bibles, I tried it, and I don't get it, these same people will try this backwards too. They'll try not to fulfill the lust of the flesh so they can then walk in the Spirit. But this is backward. Backward. Galatians, Paul said to the Galatians, that's not how it works. Walk in the Spirit. And then you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Do you see the difference? This is, all, this is the difference in whether, whether you succeed or fail. Let's say it again this way. Same thing. James 4, 7. Submit yourselves to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The same people who refuse to read the Bible because they don't understand it are still trying to resist the devil so they can submit to God. But James says, that's backwards. While you are acting like a devil, while you are just doing every devilish thing there is, start submitting to God. And the more you do that, the less and less trouble you'll have resisting the devil. Do you hear me? The order matters. People, people got, well, the world is upside down, of course. People think they need to straighten up and start going to church. Start going to church. Straighten up will take care of itself. If you straight when you come here, we don't want you. That's too much pressure for the rest of us. Here's the, this is the bottom line in that. Victory never comes from suppressing evil desires, but from reinforcing good desires. So the way to win at life is always seek God first. All those bad habits, you're trying to fix all them so you can get right with God. You're upside down and backwards and sideways. Seek the Lord first. Just do that. Think on those things. Think on that. This other stuff will just get forced out the other end. If you have it on your computer hard drive, I don't care how big that hard drive is, if you get enough information on there at some point, it will be full and cannot take any more. If you keep bringing in more good and more good and more good, and all the time, all the bad stuff is washing out the back end, so to speak, you keep filling it up. It's like flushing bad water or gas or anything else. You keep putting the good in. Eventually, the old will be washed out. That's how you do it. You overcome evil with good. You don't wait until you can change then do it. No. Come to Christ. He helps us change. Okay? Okay. So if you really know what you're doing, we'll see you Sunday morning, 11 o'clock or before, and uh, we're going to say bye-bye for now. God bless you and thank you.